In this particular discussion of the three bosons, uh, the three, three massless bosons as a formal field theory, we, uh, um, we discussed the data solar algebra of that theory. We uh, looked at the state operator map in the context of that theory. We found an operator corresponding to every state in the theory, <coughs> and vice versa. And uh, we discussed the notion of a primary operator of the conformal algebra. And we, for a single free boson, we found that there were exactly were one plus one into infinity primary operators. The primary operators were into pi k dot x, into pi k x for every value of k. Um, and then at the special value k equals zero, there was also x. Um, any questions or comments about uh, about the stuff we talked about last class before? Yes. Second, uh, we Yes. So, the, what does the analog of special conformal transformation say? You see, in the conformal algebra here, this whole Vera solar algebra, uh, there is the global subgroup which is S, SL two R times SL. This is the part for which the central extension term matches. Okay, remember we had a C into C square minus one. So M into M square minus one. So M was equal to zero. 1 or minus 1, that term vanished. So there's no mixing with identity. Okay? So this is just a continuation of the uh, conformal algebra from higher dimensions down to d equals 2. In general dimensions, in general dimensions, d is conformal algebra as s with d comma 2. Uh, if you set d equals to 2, this is SO2 comma 2. And just like SO4 is SU2 times SU2. SO2 comma 2 happens to be the subject. Okay, so now what in the language that we are used to in higher dimensions, what are the various generators of the set that you are? So what were they? There was L minus one, L zero, L one, and the L minus one bar, L zero bar, L one. These are the various generators. Okay, now in the language of higher dimensional, the higher dimensional theory. Okay. What uh, what are the operators L0 and L0 bar? As we've mentioned a couple of occasions, L0 plus L0 bar is what we normally call the definition. Then L0 minus L0 bar is what we normally call angular momentum. Angular momentum in uh, um, in uh, uh, in a higher dimensional theory, in in the d-dimensional theory. Is a non is generated by the non-abelian group S O D. By angular momentum, I mean really Euclidean angle. This is general. Oh, no, let's say angular momentum on the scale. You understand what I mean? Let me say this again. In a higher dimensional, uh, in a higher dimensional theory, how does the uh, how does the state operator map? How does the map between uh, states on some manifold and operators of the theory? The map proceeds as before by a radial one. So you take R to the power B, Euclidean space, and quantize it on lines of constant radius. This is the same thing as quantizing the theory on a, line, on, on a unit sphere. Why is that? It's because the metric Vs squared, which is equal to Gr squared plus R squared B squared, omega B minus 1 squared, of the course, the same thing as Gr squared by R squared plus B omega B minus 1 squared times R squared. Okay? And therefore, is y equivalent to the metric d R squared by R squared plus the omega d minus R squared. So if we define a new coordinate, namely t is equal to log R, this is d t squared plus d omega d minus 1 squared. Okay? So the metric of flat space is y equivalent to the metric of a, a, a cylinder where the base of the cylinder, you know, cross section of the cylinder, is at an SD minus one. It's a natural generalization of a cylinder to higher dimensions. Okay? So the way that the state operator map works is that we've got states on this, this unit SD and operators in R. So the angular momentum is rotations of the unit SD minus one. Okay? 
Okay, so it's SOD. Okay, in this case, the unit d minus one is a circle. The rotations of that are just the u one, u one group. So the, this is the u one angular momentum algebra, generated by zero minus x. Now, what about the other case? What are l one and l minus one in the language of the higher dimension the form? Okay, I'm sorry, this is a very long answer. And for those of you who don't know about the higher dimensional the formula algebra, not very informative, but since it does, give me a minute. Okay, um, what are L1 and L minus 1 in the language of higher dimensions? Well, you know, right, the remaining generators, what are the generators of the taken formula algebra in higher dimensions? It's dilatations, angular momentum, momenta, and special conformal transformations. Momenta carry positive weight on the dilatations, special conformal transformations carry negative weight on the Okay? So, what are the momenta? It's n minus 1. Right? Um, oh, yeah. Let me get to this bit stuff. Uh, yeah, these, these were the lazy operators. So, l, 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 it's n minus 1. Okay? And what were the. Um, uh, what were the. Uh, uh, what, uh, what were the special informal transformations? They were the L ones, L1 and L1 power. Now, what was our condition for primary operators? A condition for primary operators was that the operator was annihilated by Ln for all positive Ln. In particular, it's annihilated by L1. So in particular, it's annihilated by the special limit. So an operator that is primary in the sense of the Vera solo action is in particular a primary under SL2 or tensor SL2 in the usual way. But it's much more. Okay? An oper a primary operator, a particular representation of the Vera Sol algebra can be decomposed into an infinite number of representations on the SL2 or tensor SL2. Vera Sol symmetry is much more powerful than the usual uh, was this clear? Is this clear? Okay, excellent. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, but uh, at some point you also argued that momentum was L0 by L0 by L0. Oh, now, you see, there, there are two different generators that you might call momentum. There's the generator that generates del mu, just translations on the plane. All right. That's what I'm calling momentum. Okay. Okay? Yeah. And then there is the generator that generates translations on the cylinder. Translations on the cylinder are clearly just rotations. That's what here I'm calling it. Okay? So these are just different names. Okay? Yeah, good. Excellent. Other questions or comments? Uh, in the last class, we first studied the general case of uh, uh, the, the general case and later on where the speed goes on. There we were constructing straight seasons, alpha m's and alpha m's. For the general case, we studied LMs of LMs. So is there a like, change of basis between the two? No, you see, even in the free boson theory, we have the LMs. Okay, so the question is, why didn't we look, when we looked at particular operators, in order to understand what the, you know, we use these alpha M's a lot. Okay? Now let's remember what we use the alpha M's for. We use the alpha M's to try to identify which state a particular operator was due. Now, why did we use the alpha ends? We use the alpha ends because we could label states by how alpha ends acted on them. Okay? So, if you want to establish a state operator map, that is a particular thing about a particular conformity. You have to have some notion of what your states are. And then, you can figure out what the states are by the action, in, the, in this particular case, by the action of the of the other. Okay, so you know anything that you can do in general will not work for a will will not work for particular properties of a particular thing. Here we wanted to understand the full spectrum of this theorem. Okay, and we wanted to classify that spectrum in terms of you know check that the spectrum is a set of operators. Okay, so it was not sufficient to work with in terms of elements, just because it was more structured to this theory than simply the symmetry. See, all of the formal field theories of the symmetry have the Vera Solo symmetry. 
But all conformity in theory is only at the same spectrum of operators. So we don't just use just the symmetry algebra to characterize the Okay. Had we been interested though in the question of which states were primaries, for that question it was sufficient to use just. So the last part of the last lecture, that's what we did. We reverted to not looking at these alpha ends, but T's. Looked at the T, o T operator product expansion between T and various operators. So, so for the question of which state is a primary under the Weresor algebra, you use T's. But for detailed characterization of the states, you use all the structure of the theory. For which it was convenient to use up there. Is this clear? Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, so let me uh, um, let me uh, before much of the point of today's class. Today will be our last lecture. General conformity theory techniques. From the next lecture, we will revert to string theory. We are now well educated, so we will be able to do our quantization of the string in a sophisticated. Um, but uh, there are a few things I need to tell you, a few more things I need to tell you about, uh, about the, gen the structure of general conformity. One of the things is this, I promised to show you at some point that in any unitary conformity theory, all operator dimensions are positive. And that the only di operator of dimension zero is the idea. <coughs> okay? So, well, let's check. Uh, suppose I've got some operator O. Okay? And in order to, to establish this result, what I'm going to do is to look at L minus 1. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to do is to look at the operator. Okay, let me first assume that O is an SL2 operator. Okay, let me assume that O is an SL2 primary, not necessarily a full of primary. Okay, I'm going to establish this result for uh, SL2 primaries, but uh, then it will follow for every primary, every operator because every other operator is built out of a primary by acting with acting with raising operators. It has higher dimension than the primary. Okay? So I'm going to establish the result just for primaries. I could have done could be as our primary. I will only need that as an essential operator. Okay? So let me establish this and then I'll say it again and you tell me. <coughs> so suppose O is an SL2 R primary. Could in particular have been a bit of Okay? So what what we know about this is that A is that O is annihilated by L1. As we discussed. Okay, so now let's consider the operator L minus 1 activity. Okay, let's look at its norm. Its norm is L minus 1 dagger, L minus 1 acting on a. Okay, I will through these lectures flip between states and operators. I sometimes call this the operator O. What I mean is the state dual to the operator O under the state operator. Okay, now that we have the state operator map, states and operators can be interchanged freely in terminology. Okay, at the moment I'm dealing with the state, I will sometimes call it an operator. Just, okay. Fine. So, this is the norm of the state. Okay, now, this is equivalent to, okay, firstly, what is L minus 1 dagger? L1. That is how we, that is the reality. <coughs> Okay, now this is the same thing as L1, L minus 1, or O. Why? Because L1 and O are 0. But now what is L1 and L minus 1 and O? Well, we know the Venus or algebra. We worked that. Okay, uh, so L1, L minus 1 and O. What? It's proportional to L0. If somebody can give me the number, that would be Huh? Two. Two. It's two times L zero times zero. Because there was an M minus A. So one minus minus one. So that is the two. Okay? We didn't have the term from uh, from the identity piece. We didn't have the term from the identity piece because M was equal to one. <coughs> C into M times square minus one. Okay? But 
now what do we know about this? This is positive definite because it was the norm of the state. Okay? But this is just two times H O, the eigenvalue of O under H. Okay. Okay? So if we take any operator of the definite scaling dimension. Okay, the definite holomorphic scaling dimension. That definite holomorphic scaling dimension has to be positive. Is this clear? All zero. Positive or zero. Good. Now, when can it be zero? It can only be zero if L minus 1 and O is zero. Because the only state in a unitary in a unitary Hilbert space that has zero norm is the zero state. Okay? So H O equals zero implies L minus one on O is equal to zero. Okay. Now what is suppose O was some operator O then? What is the state dual to what is the operator dual to L minus one on O? The translation. So this is the operator, this is the state you will do. Tell that O. This is something we have used many times. L minus 1 act always acts by derivative. For every local operator. Could somebody prove this for me? Okay. Going from here to here, can you prove this? I, I'll do it on the board, I won't ask you to come and do it. Oh, well, somebody wants to do it on the board, that's good. But I know if I'm... Okay. Uh, you can write down the specific form of L minus 1 and... Uh, ah, so uh, help me watch it ahead. L minus 1 over twice pi i... Very good. 1 over 2 pi i. Uh, Contulent into... Yes. Of, uh, L minus 1 is uh, Z times, del, uh, times T. Z times? Uh, T. Yes. Yeah. Times Z times what power? Uh, plus one. M plus one. M plus one is one. So so minus one plus one is zero. Yeah. Times T times O. Times O. Times O, o inserted where? At zero. At zero. At zero. At zero. Because we've got a diagram. Yeah. This was the state. O inserted. Yeah. And we've got this operation. O and zero. Now what? Zero the calculator by taking a considering O P. Yes. So and because the most singular term only the pole. Only the pole. Okay. This term could have higher singularity. Yes. Could have lower singular. I mean, non singular. Yes. <laughs> okay. But you become only the pole because of Cauchy's here. What is the pole? Del Z. Oh, I said Z minus zero because yeah. we zero. We've got this integral around. Cauchy's theorem kills all this nonsense. It gives us just. Zero. So what we're left with is an insertion of what operator the other? Del Z of zero, which is the definition of this thing. Is this totally clear? Okay? It was more or less clear. <coughs> but the thing is we don't have to deal with more or less. Everything is so simple. It's clear. Okay? <laughs> okay? So uh, okay. So, this is the state corresponding to the del Z of O, the insertion of del Z of O. Now, we have set that H O is 0 only if the state is 0. The, the only way you can get that the state is 0 is the operator. So, the only operator that has 0 holomorphic dimension is an operator such that del Z of O equals 0. H O equals 0 implies in a unitary H of O is equal to 0 implies that uh, del Z of O is equal to 0. We use unitarity because we use the fact that if a state is 0 norm, the state must be 0. Unitarity is statement about time evolution? Well, you can think of it as a statement about time evolution, or you can think about it as a statement about the structure of the inner product. See, that the Hermi, that the that the time evolution operator is Hermitian is a statement about unitarity is the statement that the time evolution operator is Hermitian. Okay? 
but is Hermitian with respect to a positive definite inner product? Okay? Oh, so you can make the Hamiltonian idea. Hermitian, you can always make an Hermitian if you fool around with the inner product. Okay? So that's how often our non unitary theories work. The Hamiltonian looks Hermitian, but the inner product is not positive. And that, of course, can change. If you put the right eyes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, excellent. Okay, so wh what we concluded is that the only operator that is zero holomorphic dimension is an operator that is holomorphic. Okay. Now let us uh, let us look in particular at a conserved current. Is anti Is anti Thank you. Thank you. Is anti uh, Let us look in particular at a conserved current. Okay, um, a conserved current. Okay, because this current is conserved, uh, this operator has dimension one comma zero. Just because the integral p z of j z is your conserved number, a number is dimension zero, integrating something is dimension minus one. Okay, so this operator is always dimension one comma zero. Whereas this operator is always dimension zero. Okay? What does this mean? Since this operator dimension H0 is zero to zero, what can we say about L Z of J Z bar is equal to zero. Similarly, L Z bar of J Z is equal to zero. So you see what we've almost proved? Okay, we've almost proved that in a conformity theory, any conserved current, the holomorphic part of the current is a holomorphic function. Whereas the anti-holomorphic part of the current is an anti-holomorphic function. Okay? Notice that this did not follow from conservation. Conservation was the statement that del z bar j z plus del z j z bar is equal to zero. What we have shown here is that it works piece by piece. Okay? Now, the problem with this theorem is that there is a counter example. <laughs> okay? Uh, that's why we've almost shown this. Okay? Uh, I, let me say one or two. We, would, we will ex, I will explain this in a little more detail as a little later. Okay? But I just alert you to the, to the problem. See, all of the theorems that we have proved and everything we've said, including the state operator map, okay, really works very well in the case when we've got a gapped conformal field theory. By which I mean, a conformal field theory, once you consider it on the cylinder, spectrum as a vacuum, first excited state, second excited state, are separated by a gap. Okay? As you know, this, this conformal field theories that we have looked at so far are, are like the conformal field theories of a string propagating in some space time manifold. So, if that space time manifold was compact, then you see the oscillator part, as we've seen, always has a gap. So zero more, that's the problem. Zero more is just quantum mechanics. Okay? And if you had some quantum mechanics propagating on a non compact space like R, like we do have in the simplest theory. Okay, the theory is not gapped. One way of making it gapped is to take the space-time coordinate and make it a and make it identify it into a circle. Then the zero mode, and then the zero mode spectrum is also completely gapped. Okay, another way is to change the theory, put a few more x's and deal, you know, have the space-time theory living on something like a sphere. This is what happens in what we call waste Okay. So all the theorems that I'm talking about, for instance, that use the state operator map freely, all could have subtleties in situations where there is no gap separating the vacuum from the first excited state on the cylinder. Okay? And I'm not going to dwell more on these subtleties now, if we want to finish our, our first round discussion, but we will come back to it at a later point in our study. I just wanted to alert you. So these theorems are real theorems in conformal field theories 
where there is a gap in the spectrum on the cylinder, or equivalently a gap in the spectrum of operators, the scaling dimensions of operators. Okay? These theorems do not really apply to the theory we studied because there was no gap in the spectrum of operators. What was the dimension of this gap? Alpha square. What? K squared alpha prime by 4. K is a continuous number ranging from 0 to anything. It's just the fact that you know the zero mode can have any momentum you want. Arbitrarily low momentum is your arbitrarily low energy. Okay? And this gap causes basically IR divergences which can invalidate some of these time results. Okay? Uh, we will come back to studying that when we study, for instance, the Lorentz. Actually, the free boson theory, it's not. With one boson, it's fine. In a collection of many free bosons, the Lorentz, the generator of Lorentz symmetries, actually does not have this problem. It comes from the problems with the zero. We will study that. Okay, so I just wanted to alert you to the fact that this theorem, this quote unquote theorem, is not, has a way out. One way will come to it. But in many situations, and actually for most currents, even in the, even in the theory, theories where this does not apply, this is just a general. This, this works. And is the reason why we assumed in our analysis of what identities that JZ was analytic, while JZ bar was anti analytic. Okay, this was the logic. Okay, any, other, any questions or comments about this? It's not easy to see it. But it's not easy. We will see it. As we go, it has to be infrared. This is always easy to see. Not easy to see. Okay, 98 mm -hmm. looks like we proved the theorem. Theorems are always dangerous in physics. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, really, all we assume is that the state operator map works. Mm -hmm. Now, the arguments are given the state operator map were very clear. Do the path then. How do you know there's not a problem with the path then? Okay. Yeah, okay. So, it's sometimes a trouble. Okay. So things are working well, it's a theorem. Things are not working well, it's not a theorem, which means it's not a theorem. Yeah, but you see here what we are talking about is the operator spectrum of the CFD. That is unaffected by what manifold you study this. Yeah, so no, that will not not go. Okay. Um, uh, okay, let's move on. Okay. Actually, there's one more thing I want to say along these general lines. <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah. There's one more thing I want to say along these general lines. Uh, and uh, uh, okay. Could somebody remind me of what the Virasov algebra we found? What, what was the constant term? What? No, there's a delta function choosing opposite modes. Ah, choosing opposite modes. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. Let me leave this as an exercise for you, which you can try to work out and Show by using L M L minus M by using this computer so that this term is activated. Okay? That it's impossible for a conformal field theory to be unitary unless the central charge. Okay? Next class I'll ask somebody to come and work this out a little more. So show that the central charge in any Conformal in any conformal field, unitary conformal field, it must always be positive. Do something clever to show that. Uh, you might want to use this this combination. Yeah, actually, the many ways of doing it. Okay, I'll leave this as an exercise. That's another nice result to know that C is always greater than zero. Cannot be zero, cannot be negative in a unitary. Field. Okay, so, so I'm going to move on. And so the main point of today's class is to uh, is to talk about uh, other free conformal field theories, other than the free boson, 
which will enter into our study of it. Okay? Um, the most the most important of this is the so-called BC system. Uh, yeah. Is the greater than equal to zero? No, if it's equal to zero, then the theory is, has only one state. It's just a vacuum state. There's, there's no unitary conformity in theory, there's non trivial with C equals C. Yeah, so by conformity theory, I mean a theory with more than one state. Okay, great. Um, great, so let's move on. So, the, uh, uh, okay. the theory I'm going to ask, uh, the, the theory we will study it is um, the so called BC system. And I will motivate this, the construction of this theory. I'll motivate the construction of this theory by looking at the uh, uh, by looking at the action of a free fermion. Okay, a free massless fermion in two dimensions. So as all of you know, the action of a free massless fermion is uh, psi bar uh, del slash psi in Lorentz space. Okay, so psi bar del slash psi Lorentzian space is the action of a free, uh, free fermion. Okay, uh, this is true up to some plus minus here. We get the plus minus right at the end. It's massless. I'm, I'm looking at just massless. Okay, so now I want to make this, this, uh, uh, this construction a bit more explicit. Okay, so I choose a basis for my gamma matrices. So the gamma matrices in two dimensions, gamma mu. I want to choose them so that gamma mu, gamma mu is equal to 2 g mu mu, 2 beta mu mu. And I also want to choose them such that gamma mu dagger um, is equal, so gamma 0 dagger is equal to minus gamma 0, and gamma 1 dagger is equal to gamma 1. Okay? So that gamma mu dagger is gamma mu up to a factor of the metric. Okay, we are always using a mostly positive dimension. Okay, so let's try to make an explicit. What? Antigonal. Okay, let's uh, um, uh, let's make an explicit choice. Okay, so we know that the minimum number of dimensions in which you have non-trivial algebra is matrices in two dimensions, and we know that two dimensions is sufficient. 2 plus 2 matrices are sufficient because we have three Pauli matrices that are made there. The Clifford algebra, we just have to choose, um, we just have to choose two of these. Let's choose the two to be sigma 2 and sigma 1. Okay, this I will identify with gamma 0. I sigma 2. I sigma 2 and sigma 1. This one I will identify with uh, gamma 0. And this one I will identify with gamma 1. Okay, so now let's write down the action explicitly. Okay, so the action was sidebar. Okay, firstly now, notice that our gamma matrices are, are chosen to be real. Okay, because we were able to choose our gamma matrices to be real, it is consistent in this with this choice of basis. To just set the spinners in such a way phi star is equal to sign. The, spin, the components of the spinner can be set to be zero. If the gamma matrices were not, were for some general complex guys, this would not be consistent. Why not? You see, under the Lorentz group, <coughs> the generators of the Lorentz group are commutators of gamma matrices. Okay? If these commutators of gamma matrices were in general arbitrary complex uh, matrices, they would act on a real column to produce a complex column. So it would not be consistent to set the spinners to be real, consistent with having an action of uh, the Lorentz algebra. But a finite rotation will always have an i in the... Will always have an i, but notice that your uh, uh, generators are i, gamma mu, gamma mu. 
So you take e to the power i of this. So it becomes red. Okay? So if your gamma matrix is for either pure imaginary or pure real, then your rotations will always be or your real matrices. So it's consistent to have the uh, consistent to have uh, these spinners real. It's also you get some similar, similar considerations all from the Dirac position. If you want, if your gamma matrix is arbitrarily com complex and you want the solutions of the Dirac equation, you would not get real solutions. But the gamma matrix is real, you get real solutions. Okay? Because this is a special case of complicated theory of how to set reality conditions of spinners. Some of you know very well. But in this trivial special case, we don't need that general theory. Just set the spinners to be real. Okay? So our spinners here, two component spinners, we call them psi. At the moment, I'll just call them psi class and psi minus. We'll get a better name for them soon. And each of psi class and psi minus just as a number, an anti complete number, is real. Psi plus star cycles. Psi minus star cycles. Right? Okay. Next thing we want to do is to understand what the action, what the uh, what the Dirac action is. Okay? So the Dirac action is psi plus psi minus. Now this is psi bar. Psi bar is not quite the same as psi transpose because it has a gamma zero. Okay? So we get gamma zero. Okay, we get gamma zero, and then we get um, gamma zero del zero plus gamma one del one psi. This is our action. Okay, but this is the same as psi plus, psi minus, gamma zero squared is minus one, minus del zero. Gamma 0, gamma 1. Now what's that? So that's i times sigma 2 times sigma 1. Now sigma 2 times sigma 1 was minus i times sigma 3. So this is i times minus i times sigma 3. So that's sigma 3. Okay? Plus sigma 3, gamma 3. That's 1. Times psi plus psi minus. Okay? Now we just expand another matrix. So, what we get here is uh, my psi plus into minus del 0 plus del 1 psi plus. Okay, are we going to figure out the factor behind the action uh, where, where there was i or plus or minus? We <laughs> don't then uh, actually this uh, uh, this is not just gamma naught, it's i gamma naught. Uh, when you have to take psi bar. No, psi bar is just gamma naught. Okay, okay. Uh, anyway, even if it's proportional, we'll figure out the final proportional and the construct. Okay. Okay. It depends on your definition of bar. I will find psi bar as gamma. Okay. Yeah. Um, plus psi minus minus del zero plus minus del one. Psi plus. Okay. So the action at least is proportional. Some number. Okay. Sir. No, no. Everything goes. You see, if we were in Euclidean signature, we wouldn't have the gamma data. In Euclidean signature, the dark action is psi star. Then slash psi. Okay? This is purely a Lorentzian discussion. It's very dangerous in physics to start with Euclidean signature. Okay? Euclidean signature in discussing real physics is a trick. You start with the Lorentzian signature and then analytically continue to that's what we're doing. Okay? The main danger if you start with Euclidean signature is that you get the reality properties. Okay? Reality properties are set in Lorentzian space and then analytically continue just as your trick. Yeah, and that's always that's always the philosophy. We uh, uh, we adapt. Okay? Had we made the Euclidean signature, there would have been extra eyes. 
Because if you become an analytic and analytic, anti analytic, yeah, as they will, as we will see. Okay. Now, one question here that you could ask, so this is an aside, but it's an aside that got Kartik and me confused two weeks ago, so I, uh, and in a you know, completely different context. So I will uh, just tell you about it. Okay? Um, you know, in a theory of bosons, in a theory of bosons, there is a definite sign for the action. Okay? Because the theory of bosons, the action should be kinetic minus potential. So if you ask me, if you take del mu, del mu, suppose you've got action pi dot squared minus pi prime squared. And you ask me, is the action with the plus, is this with the plus sign or this with the minus sign? Plus. Okay? And many things would go wrong. Uh, if you show us the action with the minus sign, and then they've got to make it. Because classically, you don't care. Overall sign behind an action, who cares? Same equation to motion. But quantum mechanics, many things go wrong. Okay? Now you can ask, what is, what is the situation with, uh, uh, with fermions? When we've got a path integral with anti commuting fields, is there a definite sign for the action? If so, what is the principle? You know, what sets the principle for uh, uh, for, for for that uh, for that sign? Okay, and uh, the answer to this question in general goes like this: Suppose you've got some. Uh, suppose you've got uh, you've got let's say alpha star alpha. An anti commuting path integral with alpha star alpha dot. Okay? Now, uh, if we do the fermionic version of canonical quantization of this, this theory, and we do it carefully, something we will be doing with me, I will do this carefully for that's Okay, the fermionic version of canonical quantization. We didn't, we have, right, yeah, we, have, we will do this carefully. Okay? Um, this basically what's the momentum conjugate to alpha, it's alpha star, momentum con the other way, the other way. So you get something like some statement like alpha star alpha is equal to one. Okay? That is the kind of thing that will, up, up, will appear from canonical context. But whether you get one or minus one depends on the sign behind this. You change the sign, you get minus one. Now, if alpha and alpha star are complex conjugates of each other, alpha star alpha anti commutator is alpha alpha star plus alpha star alpha. It's a positive definite operator. Okay? So this is equal to 1. It's consistent in a unitary theory. This is equal to minus 1 is not. Uh, it should be i or minus i. It's a positive definite operator. Ah, the i, I or minus i. Why? Let's see how does this go. Um, yeah, so okay, let me do this more carefully. So suppose, yes, I, I think you're probably yeah, yeah. Suppose we had i alpha star alpha, and the right rule was we differentiate from the left. Or we, let's say the right rule was we differentiate from the right. Okay, then p alpha would be equal to i alpha star. Okay. So we will get alpha commutator of i alpha star, uh, uh, alpha Poisson bracket i alpha star is equal to 1. Okay, then we will convert this into the quantum commutator, we put an extra factor of i, we cancel the i, yeah. So this one would give us positive definiteness, but minus of this would give us negative definiteness. Okay, so this is the general rule. This is the general rule, and it's this principle, the principle of unitarity, that comes out of quantization of this action, that sets the right sign for this action in Minkowski space. Okay, uh, I think Kartik am I right that, the, the, that this was the right sign? I alpha star alpha. When you do it carefully, so, so your fermionic actions, when you write it, always have to take the form. Integral i alpha star alpha dot with the fermionic variables in this order. Alpha star first, alpha dot. 
Okay. Unitarity after quantization demands that. Okay. Now, in uh, our particular case, alpha star was simply alpha. Okay. So, this action would be correct if I put S is equal to minus I. Psi plus minus, uh, um, maybe I'll write it as I times L0 minus L1 psi plus plus psi minus L0 plus L1. Okay, this is our correct starting Lagrangian in the let's see. I just made an overall. Okay, so this is the correct starting action, and this is what we're going to use uh, to proceed with. Any questions or comments about this? Excellent. <coughs> now, before before doing quantum mechanics, let's quickly do some classes in this section. Okay, what is the equation of motion beside plus? Equation of motion beside plus is del zero minus del one psi plus. Equal to zero. What is the equation of motion psi minus? Del zero plus del one psi minus is equal to zero. So you see that psi plus is purely right moving, while the psi minus is purely left moving. So you see that the free fermion in two dimensions is very much like a free boson. Free bo uh, a free boson had as its solution had solutions to the equations of motion purely like right, left moving guys and purely right moving. Yeah, the free fermion does something sort of similar. It's other way around actually. What? Psi plus is purely left moving because right moving moment. Yes, psi plus is well. I don't know. Let's say that's one. As time increases, x increases. Is that right or left? Depends on which way you look at it. It moves that. Side plus moves that way, side plus moves that way. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's not. Good. Okay. So, excellent. So, uh, the, the way the free fermion works is that you've got two different components, one of which is purely left moving, the other is purely right moving. So, sort of similar to a free boson. Which has both of these in the same component. Right. Okay, so one of these is sort of like delta x, the other one is some sort of like delta x. Okay? Let's move on. Now we analytically continue to Euclidean space. <laughs> By the way, what is our reality property? Psi plus tau is psi plus. Psi minus tau is psi minus. That will be our reality property forever. Okay. Now we move to Euclidean space. What was the analytic continuation? The analytic continuation to Euclidean space was minus i v0 d t Lorentzian. It should have become minus v0 d t Euclidean, which means t Lorentzian is equal to minus i t. So, let's analytically continue this whole action. We had i. Now, so that means that del t Lorentzian, del t l is equal to i del t e. Okay. So, we have i into t Lorentzian gives us a minus i t Euclidean. That goes with the measure that the T Euclidean, the T, the sigma, okay, times um, this one becomes um, this one becomes what? Becomes <coughs> I del T. Okay, now every time you okay, so I del T minus I del sigma, sorry, minus del sigma, minus del sigma, psi plus, psi plus. Okay, 
okay, plus psi minus into uh, I del P plus del sigma psi minus okay and then finally there was a question of what now we want to rework this in terms of the same the same Z and Z okay so uh, uh, our z and z bar derivatives were what? We had z was equal to sigma plus it. And, no, is that what we did? Can somebody look up there? What was our z? Was it this way or t plus it? t plus it. z was equal to t plus i sigma. Sigma. Okay. Z was equal to sigma plus I T. Okay, so say Z is sigma plus I T. Z bar is equal to sigma minus I T. Del Z was, again, somebody help me. But Del Z is, of course, uh, um, of, is Del sigma. Uh, I'll give you that's okay. Del Z is equal to Del Sigma by Del Z, Del Sigma plus Del T by Del Z, Del T. But Sigma was equal to Z uh, plus Z bar by 2. T was equal to uh, I T. So T is 1 by I, Z minus Z bar. And so del z was equal to half del sigma um, uh, minus i del z del t. Del z power was equal to half del sigma plus i del t. Okay. So these two guys, uh, these two guys up to an overall factor of 2, which you know, you can absorb it a redefinition of what is high class and minus is, uh, is the same thing as d2 sigma, and now this is del sigma minus i del t, so psi plus del z psi plus, okay, plus psi minus del z bar This term. Yeah. Okay, this looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Okay. Fine. So what we got now is a decoupled sum of two theories. One of which, in one of which the fields are purely holomorphic. Okay? And the other of which the fields are purely anti-holomorphic. So the guys where the fields are purely homomorphic, the sign I'm going to rename sum. And the guys where the fields are purely anti-holomorphic, psi plus, we will rename psi. Okay? And in the rest of this lecture, 
whichever one he will do is to study the whole of object theory. That is, you can do all the same stuff from the ante. Okay. So, what we will do is to study the action S is equal to psi minus del z bar psi. So where, where? So I put it back there. Uh, the the positive overall I that went to get away into absorbing being absorbed in the nation. I think the action we want to study is justice. Okay? In fact, in this lecture we will study a generalization of this action. A generalization of this action uh, to the theory uh, D2Z B del Z bar C. Where these two fields are not necessarily the same. Okay. Uh, you can easily convince yourself that if you have two copies of such a question, okay, uh, you can define uh, some then differences of uh, the two different psi pluses to go to this form. So this theory is like two copies of such, a, of such an action, and is the theory we're going to study. Um, is the theory we're going to study as we move along? Why? Why? Because this is also going to arise as the course action for the result. Uh, why don't you study just one for me on? It's what we need. Okay. Uh, yeah. Anything you want to know about this theory can be used. It's not no no like okay. It's like studying a complex for me. That's another way of saying. Suppose we hadn't set the Pokemon to be there. We'd allowed it to be complex. We would have ended up with that. But one of these yeah. these would have complex conjugation uh, relations. Okay. So just like we study the free boson conformal field theory. Okay? We're going to study this, the theory defined by this unit action. Now what we're going to see is something sort of interesting. Okay? What we're going to see is something sort of interesting. And that interesting thing is the following. With the same action, okay? With the same action, it is possible to have many different consistent stress tensors. In order to see this, I'm going to first show you the same phenomenon just for the free boson theory. And you will see that there's an analogous phenomenon in this theory. Okay. So, suppose you had a theory just governed by this action. Just governed by the action integral 1 by 2 pi alpha prime L Z L bar Z L bar X like we have this time. And suppose you knew the action just in suppose you knew the action just in um, okay first, first let me just do some algebra then we can consider minus one by alpha prime del x del x plus V L squared. Consider this this operator. This operator I'm just going to call it P. And just as a little exercise in computing operator product expansion, I'm going to compute the t tilde t tilde operator product expansion. Okay, I'll just check that I've got my sines to match. Uh, yeah, plus v then is where there is perfect. Okay? Just as an exercise in computing operator product expansion, we're going to compute the OP of t tilde of itself. Okay. What we're going to do is compute t tilde of z, t tilde of z. Okay. Now what do we get? Well, let's see. So there are of course purely regular terms. Okay. But there are other uh, th there are the other terms. So there are the terms in which you contract. There are the terms in which you contract every ring of it. So let's see. So we could either you, you know, there is the part where you have just this with itself. That part we've already worked out. Okay? So if I call this guy just T. Okay? That gives us 
my, so one one part is minus is uh, one by two z uh, to the four. W z minus w to the power four plus two t of w z minus w to the six squared plus del z del w t of w by z minus. <coughs> This is the part that we got by just taking this term. We've already done. But we've got three other kinds of terms. Or right, two other kinds of terms. The kind of term where we, where we take just this guy with itself, or the cross terms. Let's work those guys out. Okay. Right? Let's first do the easier guy. Let's just take this guy with itself. Okay? When we take just this guy with itself, what do we get? We get v squared times del squared x of z times del squared x of w. Now, if we want to get something similar, we have only one option. We have to contract this to this. This is just one x here, one x here. Okay? So, this gives us v squared times del squared w del squared z minus alpha prime by 2 log z minus w. Okay? So now let's take the derivatives. Let's first take the z, z derivatives. Okay? Actually, because we've got two w derivatives, that's the same as having all four z derivatives. The w derivatives minus z derivatives, there are two of them. So it's just four, all z derivatives. So the first time we take the derivative, we get minus half, minus alpha prime by two, and then we will get a z minus w. Then, I'm now just keeping track of the factors. We get minus alpha prime by 2, and then we will get a factor of minus 1 when we take the next derivative. Then, the next derivative we get minus 2, and the next derivative we get minus 3. And what we left with is 1 by z minus w over minus 4. Is this clear? So, if we contract this guy with itself, the total is the alpha prime itself. Uh, it's a minus is a cancel, and we get minus <coughs> three alpha prime v squared plus five plus plus, plus plus three alpha prime v squared by z minus w. Okay, so contracting this guy with itself just changes this half to one plus. 6 alpha prime v squared. Okay. Isn't there a Taylor expansion of v? Oh, v, v is a constant. V is just a number. It's just a factor. It could be 6. Is this clear? Okay. What remains is to do the contraction of this with this and the other. Okay, so let's do that. So we get minus one by alpha prime. Del x, del x, this is at z. And then v del squared x at w. Again, we have only one option. We can do one contraction. This guy with this guy. Okay, so we get minus v by alpha prime. Then we get minus alpha prime by 2. And now we have to be a bit careful. Okay, once again, since we've chosen this guy, these two W derivatives are the same as having all three Z derivatives. Okay, so all three Z derivatives give us um, nothing, because log minus one and minus two. Okay, so we have total, so, now let's keep uh, our wits about us. Why was this minus alpha prime? Uh -huh. This is because this guy had minus. This was because the OP, I mean, log came with a minus, and then there are two more minuses, so it's plus. One and two, so we get rid of the two. Okay? One by z minus w, the whole thing, q. And factor of two. Oh, I thought I'd taken account the factor of two. You mean the other term? Yeah. Well, the other term is different. We don't need to take account of that. Because 
This one's at Z and W. That one's at W and Z. Hang on. Half factor went away with this W. All right, I think I've taken account of all factors. If I'm not, please correct me. Okay, so I'm going to get V, V del X, and Z of 1 minus W cube. Excellent. All, all happy? Sir, I think you took contractions with only one X. Ah! And then there's the other. There's, there's a factor of two, say. You're right. You're right. You're right. I think you're right. Yes. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. You get two V, then X of Z by Z minus W. Thank you. Okay. Any other mistakes I've made? Excellent. Now I'm getting this, and we do the other term. The other term was what? It was V L squared X and W at Z minus 1 by alpha prime. Okay, I'll write that. Minus 1 by alpha prime. L X, L X, both at W. Yes, there should be here, and I've taken that into account. Uh, there was one by alpha prime in this, and there was an alpha prime in the two point function of the answer. No, I'm saying there'll be an alpha prime from the first and the second. Can you contact it? No, the second one doesn't have This is just this V. See, this has a one by alpha prime. Clear? Excellent. Let's go. So, uh, where were we? A minus one by okay. We we were here. Okay. So now we need the contraction. So we get uh, the factor of two. So we get, uh, and then once again we get another factor of two. Once again we now had a half, so we get the same factor, but we get an additional minus, minus sign because this has one. Two z derivatives and one w derivative. This has two w derivatives and one z derivative. Okay? And so we get v into the same thing we got here. The minus 2v del x. This time what's left behind is del x and w. Okay? Over w minus z, uh, z minus w is only 2. Now let's put them together. When we put them together, we get 2v into del x of z minus del x of w over z minus w is only 2. But this we tell x1. So this is equal to 2v into del square x of w over z minus w. Okay? And then there is the additional Taylor expansion term which goes to the 1 over z minus w. So can you see that this term is reproducing exactly what you would get if t was replaced by t delta? And if you do the one higher Taylor expansion, <coughs> you'll see this also. This is this has to. Yeah, okay. If you did that, you'll see this. Expansion of one higher. Okay. So what we have seen is the following. What we have seen is that this t delta obeys the same operator product expansion that we require of a stress test. T tilde obeys the operator product expansion that we require of a stress tensor, but with a different value of the central charge. Value of the central charge, 1 plus 6 alpha prime v squared. 
So what we see is that the free boson theory, this strange theory, has many different inequivalent Virasoro structures. The state that is now generated its own Virasoro structure. There will not be nice commutation relations between the generators of this Virasoro and the generators of the earlier Virasoro. Okay. So, there are many inequivalent Virasoro algebras sitting inside the free boson theory, which makes it clear, of course, that the free boson theory has some humongous symmetry algebra because it has to include all of these. Now, what is the symmetry algebra of the free boson theory? Actually, we can just say it because the symmetry algebra is the algebra of currents. And what, what is the set of all currents? So free boson, all holomorphic currents of free boson theory? Well, anything that you can make out of del x is, you know, so del x times e to the pi, uh, del x times arbitrary derivatives of this, all give you holomorphic currents. We've seen examples of that, the alphas were holomorphic currents. All of the operators. Uh, yeah, so this huge, humongous symmetry algebra, basically because we're dealing with a free theory. Okay? And uh, whether it's surprising or not, I don't know, but it's a fact that you just see that we've got many inequivalent Mirasoro algebra sitting inside the same in the same action. So what, what do you say about the cross between uh, various sectors? Mm. Uh, T and T tilde. T and T tilde, there is no it's the commutator between these is not determined by the Mirasoro algebra. But because of both symmetry generators of the theory. There must be a commutator which, in, which closes on the full set of symmetry generators. But in general, it does not close on either L's or L till doesn't close on something else. Mm -hmm. Reflecting the fact that the actual full symmetry algebra of the theory is a huge beast. Which your advisor has been studying more late. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, please. But you need to make a statement that the central charge of this is the you know, I should be able to compute the stress tense of my theory by varying the action with respect to the metric. In fact, didn't you tell us this two lectures ago? So why are we consistent? Okay? You've got an action, you vary it with respect to the metric, you will do the stress tensor. Oh, it doesn't have to be a unique stress tensor. It does not give you a unique stress tensor. Why not? Even better answer the total answer. Improvement terms. Good jargon, but, but, but still, still, uh, still, even better answer. Better answer is I have only told you the action of, suppose I have only told you what the action of the theory is in flat space. I have not told you how to confer a couplet to the metric in general. There are many different metric couplets that will lead to the same action in flat space. <coughs> is the coupling. One example is the coupling R and some function of x. In particular, we took V R times x. Okay, I may have got the fact. Some number that's V R x. This is a term in the action that is flat face expansion. But the stress tensor is the derivative of the action with respect to the metric. Does R have a linear component in the metric? Yes. All of you know that. Okay? So its derivative does not vanish even in flat space. Okay? And you can easily check for yourselves that if you work out what R is to linearize order and to differentiate, that will give you a stress tensor of this one. Okay? So we've got two different actions which are different in curved space in general. So if you know the theory, you know the theory and you know how it couples to an arbitrary metric, and if your definition of the stress tensor is that will always be the case in string theory, okay? Because the stress tensor will appear as you will see, because of its varying in var because of variation with respect to space time metric, uh, with respect to a metric. So as if that is your definition of a stress tensor, if you know how the action is coupled to an arbitrary metric, you know the stress tensor. But if you only know the action in flat space, you don't know the stress tensor. Please. Uh, so 
This is actually different from total derivatives because there is a way to define just tensions without the metrics, right? Yes. So it, it is true that you can think of this in terms of just improvement terms, total derivatives. This is true. Okay? But this is a physical way of saying it. That has physical consequences that you are interested in looking at the theory, coupled not, not just in flat space. Okay, so this is the this is the way of saying it that is that is most useful. Now I was just thinking because of this uh, adding this divergence thesis, I was like, how is the central charge thing getting changed? Now when you think of it in terms of curvature, then it makes sense. Because the central charge I thought like some measure of degree of freedom, right? So how can it yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you're thinking of the, in terms of Carby's formula, uh, I, there's the Carby's formula applies uh, to unitary conformity theories. Uh, this theory will tell us be non-unitary at every level. No, it's not. But it's as you say, you cannot change the growth of the density of states of the theory by a double the action that does not is not activated on the torus. This term is not activated. Okay, so the answer to your question is more. We come back to that again. Okay, it's a good question. It's an important question. It it has to do with the fact that the dimension of the vacuum state in the theory is not given by one symmetry. Okay, Cardi uses that crucial. We will come back to that when we discuss this. Okay, now other questions. Uh, why is it, uh, is, is it not true in high dimensions as well? Well, that no, it is. It is true. You could always make, but you see, here it makes, I've never encountered a case in higher dimensions would it make such a difference? It's a good question. Why, why can you try to pick up an example? It's certainly true, this phenomenon is certainly true. Um, <laughs> for instance, suppose you take a conformally coupled scalar in four dimensions. In fact, conformal invariance in that case dictates what R, what the R coupling should be. This, okay, so the, the reason is basically this. You see, what's going on? See, suppose you had um, see yeah, two dimensions somehow is, is generic. It is degenerate. Uh, the reason for this is probably that is the kinetic term for a free boson, the wild factor vanished. Okay? And this is not something that happens in any other dimension. Okay? That makes two dimensions. Okay? The curvature coupling, for instance, for the free boson in higher dimensions, the curvature coupling, just classically, like, is fixed in order to ensure wide dimensions. You may be aware of this right yeah. Yes. Okay, so uh, it's it's tight and it doesn't make you don't have so much play. Yeah, but I should give you a better. I should give you a more thought answer. Okay, um, good question. Uh, any other questions about this? Okay, um, fine. So let's move on. Yeah. Is there some similar way to see why the symmetry algebra in two dimensions is okay? Oh. Well, the easiest way to say that the symmetry algebra in two dimensions is too big is so big is just that there are so many coulombic currents. Now, uh, is there some way? Probably, I don't. I don't know what to say about. Well, I can do a calculation in some flat space latest test tensor. But the center term for the biggest test tensor is different. Different, right? So, so these are different stress tensors. They define inequivalent theta solar structure. The center that doesn't depend with you. Maybe you answered this already, but Yeah. So, as we see, as look at the example here, yeah, that you can have the same action and inequivalent vera solo symmetry sitting with them. One of these vera solo will have a particular central charge, the other will have another. Okay? What is true, and we will see this as we go on, is that only one of these, one of these vera solo symmetries will be unitary under LM is equal to L minus M like. And maybe that will take you a bit. So there's one distribution. Okay. We are so used to saying that center is one for free boson. 
Yes, now you're saying give me some other answer. Yeah, it's, it's true. It's just that if I told you the action in full count space, you may not call this a variable count. Okay? So the action here, what is the action? This LX, LX plus this. Now do you call that a free person? No, I will not call that a free person, but in the fact limit, this term whether this becomes free, but this term still remains in the stress tensor. Right? It still remains in the stress tensor. So it's yeah. So if by free boson you mean just free boson in flat space, uh, the term, the statement that C is equal to one for that theory is an inaccurate statement. Oh, it's not a complete statement. It's a choice of conformal structure under which C is equal to one. And this choice, here's the choice that it takes you to demand that this is how the action comes to constraints. Notice that in string theory, we started with an action coupled to the metric. There will be no ambiguity about what the action is in arbitrary curl space. So in string theory, we will, these ambiguities will not, there will be no ambiguity. We, we will get what we get with a particular value of C and a particular definition of the stresses. Okay, but in any other context, okay, this is something you Okay, this by the way has a name for the linear digit on Okay, we've been much lower than here. Anyway, uh, okay, it's called the linear digit on theory. And uh, the one thing we will need about this linear digit on theory, uh, this I introduced here just to make you more comfortable about what we're going to say next. <laughs> yeah. um, so I thought I would show it, show it to you in a familiar context. But uh, I'm going to ask, does somebody think they can uh, tell me the answer to this question? What is t tilde of z e to the pi kx? What is the OP of this? No, I mean, it's not one of these questions when you say zero. Should we just do it? Should we What? Sorry? What? Please what? Should we just do it? Do it by right? Do. Ah. That will be the 1 over z minus w. But what about 1 over z minus w squared? Okay? Um, I'll just quickly work this out for you. No. We're running short of time, but very quickly work it out. Minus 1 by alpha prime del x del x z. This term we've already worked out. I'll just quickly remind you how that works. This is sum over m uh, i k to the power m by m factorial x to the power m. Then we contract one of this guy with one of this guy. Or if we wanted the uh, if we wanted the guy the maximum signal, I'll just work out the maximum signal. X minus Z minus. You see, the maximum swing here, singularity is Z minus W squared. You can contract two of them. Okay, you remember we worked by <coughs> minus one by alpha prime. I'll just work it out again so that we imitate the same procedure. Minus one by alpha prime. Uh, yeah. Then, uh, uh, then the factor was M into M minus one. You remember? So this guy had M. M fellows to choose from. This guy has M minus one fellows to choose from. That made. Uh, so m into m minus 1, we got a factor of i k, the whole thing square. Uh, this remained pi k dot x because this became m minus 2, this became m minus 2 factorial, some remained, that's why I pulled out the i k. Um, and what else did we have? We had del x times x, two of those. Each of those is was minus alpha prime by 2 z minus w. Okay. So minus alpha prime by 2 squared z minus w over x squared. Okay, so that was equal to alpha prime by 4 k squared over z minus w over x squared. Okay, so the linear term we also worked out last class, I'm not going to do that here, just to save time. But it was just there. Okay. Now, uh, what, what do we get for the maximum singularity from the additional piece? The additional piece was V del squared x. Now we have sum over n 
I K X to the power M by M factorial. Only one contraction, one factor of M. Okay, so we get V into I K U into e to the pi k dot x <coughs> v into i k into e to the pi k dot x okay and then you have del squared so that gives minus alpha prime by 2 into minus 1 over 1 by z minus w Clear? Okay, so that gives us a total of uh, V i k by 2 over z minus w. Okay, I have to work out the linear term, but if you work it out, that's just the standard thing. Okay, so uh, when you work it out, you find t tilde dot of e to the pi k dot x is equal to alpha prime k squared by 4 plus v i k by 2 alpha prime v i k by 2 alpha prime over z minus w squared plus 1 over plus w okay the thing I wanted to tell you about was that this e to the power i k l x e to the power i k x remains a primary operator. Okay, remains a primary operator with, with a strange shift in dimension. Okay, in particular, the dimension of this operator uh, becomes imaginary, which is one indication that this Virasora structure will not be unitary, will not be possible to come. To, uh, to choose ln is equal to minus uh, ln is equal to l minus m back up. Okay, this formula we will later use scaling dimension of this operator under the free boson stress then so we will later use some time now. Cos, since we had this theory on the board anyway. Okay, now all this was a diversion, all this was a diversion to see the strange phenomenon of many different conformance structures in the same theory. We're now going to see the same phenomenon in a less familiar theory, which is BC. Okay. Okay, so if these free scalar theories with linear dilettons were giving you a headache, uh, forget about them. They're gone. They'll only come back much later, of course. Okay, now, now we turn to it. Uh, but should be the fact that we have complex dimensions tells you that the theory is non unitary? Non unitary if you associate Hermitian structure with these stresses. If you try to quantize the theory, make this LM is equal to minus this LM minus M. Non unitary. Yeah. This is the vertex operator that you are constructing. Yes. So, uh, in any conformal field theory with anomalies, with anomalies, uh, this uh, putting in uh, conformal anomalies, and the stress, the stress. Stress. Yes. Yes. So, does it always give rise to this uh, complex? Uh, this no, uh, just the ordinary quantization of the the free boson did not. But with this, uh, like uh, this uh, linear limit on. Uh, the linear dimension theory has it. What do we mean by any conformal field theory? The linear dimension <coughs> extension is a particular thing for the free boson. So if you put it on a, uh, this uh, curve space, then the curve network, then you, they will have some conformal anomaly. So is the uh, same See, the free boson without the linear dimension also has a conformal anomaly. The central charge is a measure of the conformal anomaly. Yes, we will understand in great detail as we go along. Okay, so the fact of the conformal anomaly has nothing to do with the, these complex ones. The ordinary free boson with the ordinary stress test had no, nothing wrong with it. In the last class, we listed out its spectrum. It's perfectly fine. Okay, so it's not to do with the conformal anomaly. It's to do with something else. That's strange. Other questions or comments? Okay, so now we return and we will 
I'll put a one over two pi, uh, two pi just to be fancy and to match the Pilchinsky, uh, L bar C. This is the theory we wish to study. Okay, so now we want to first study this theory, um, this is just a quantum field theory, before, uh, uh, before turning to studying its conformal structure. Okay, so the if you remember the first calculation we did when we studied the free boson was to, uh, um, uh, to compute the two point functions of the free boson of, of x with x uh, using the Schwinger dice. Let's do the same thing. So our action is e to the power minus, our Euclidean part of the data is e to the power minus this guy. So you treat the path of will have e to the power minus this chart. And what I'm going to do now is to take uh, uh, delta by uh, yeah. so delta by delta b. Okay, acting from the left. Delta by delta b uh, at z with an insertion of uh, e to the power minus s, e to the power minus 1 by 2 pi b delta bar c, and, and with an insertion of c of z. d, b, d, c. This, del, this thing acts as the whole thing. c of z bar. Z prime. Some other z. I thought we could call the z one z. Well, that's called z. So, like when we did the real formula, the thing we put here were holomorphic size, right? Yes. So, won't this that automatically be zero to the power of a holomorphic formula? Well, ah, so you are saying that the action on shell evaluates to zero. The holomorphic only on shell. Holomorphic only on shell. We've got a path in there. Right, right. The equation of motion tells us it's holomorphic, which means that every insertion of this operator inside the path integral will be holomorphic, unless it bangs it. But that's the path integral. It's an integral over all fields to be all fields. Okay, good question. Okay, so now we take this this the, the, this total integral of a total derivative. What do we get? We get zero. Integrals of total derivatives are zero. That's nice. But we break break up the zero. So the first thing we get is minus one by two pi b of z e to the power minus s I got again. This is when I differentiate this guy. Oh, sorry, uh, L bar c of z. Let me put the insert. Okay, and here we have a B of W. No, no. I difference, what I differentiate and what I insert are different. Okay, and the other thing that I get is uh, I have to take this through this. But since it's a bilinear fermion, it's bosonic. No sign. This guy with this guy just gives us a delta function. So plus delta. 2 of uh, z minus w <coughs> okay, is equal to 0. Okay, so we conclude that 1 by 2 pi del bar okay. 1 by 2 pi del bar of the two point function C of Z B of W is equal to delta function. Um, what? Well, this looks like 
problem in complex analysis. You're being asked to find. Uh, uh, you're being asked to find um, uh, a complex function uh, whose derivative is a delta function. Mm -hmm. Do you know what what complex function would do this? Well, one by that exactly, exactly. So let's let's check that. Okay. Okay. Um, let's check that schematically. If we can think of one by z as well, equal to del z bar of log of z z bar, and then del z of this is del z del z bar of log of z z bar, which we already know up to some numbers, gives you a delta function. Okay. So if you do this carefully, working out the numbers, you do this carefully, working out the numbers, uh, which I'm not going to do now. We've done this once very carefully, right? Okay, I'll leave you to work out those numbers. Okay, if you do this carefully, working on the numbers, what you will find is that c of z, b of w is equal to one over z. What we've not done is the number, and we'll have to leave that in this By the way, it's always a good thing to remember that a pole is not quite well known. Del z by acting on the pole is a delta function. It's not quite zero. That's always a good thing to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, It's probably you can probably see this as a restatement somehow of Cauchy's theorem. Yeah, I think you probably can, but we'll work right on that. Cauchy's theorem it picks out the non analytic. Yeah, the pole is not quite analytic. It picks out that. Okay. Right. Fine. So let's move on. Now, uh, what about the other way around? What about the what about B of W C of Z? <coughs> what should we get? <coughs> minus of what? That's equal to minus of one by Z minus W, which is equal to because it's just the same thing up to sine this anti commuting theorems. This is clear, right? Is anti commuting field, so you just get minus of this. But that's equal to 1 by w minus n. So the two point function in this BC system is that it's always 1 over the argument of the first guy minus the argument of the second guy. It doesn't matter whether the first guy is a B or a C. Okay. What can we say about B of Z, B of W? What can we say about this? One over z minus w. Well, one over z minus w. No, one over z minus w. Firstly, how would this be different? How would this yeah. derivation be different? You see, we would have to differentiate with respect to c. Okay, but there would be no delta function. Term. Okay, so that would tell you that this two-point function derivative with respect to b is simply holomorphic. Has no regularity. In particular, will it have a constant term? No, because the constant term would be b of zero, the whole thing squared, which is zero, because b is anti commuting. Okay, so the first term here would start off like z minus w. Okay, and would be <coughs> l b b. This is what will be the first term. Okay? Similarly with C with C. So C with C, the operator product expansion starts like Z minus W. B with C starts like Z minus W. B with C starts like 1 over Z minus W and in fact this is the precise. This is the precise uh, Is this clear? Questions or comments? Okay? Clear? Fantastic. Okay, now that we understand 
Um, now that we understand the two-point functions, so this is a precise statement. That was the first term, the singularity of the OP, and the two-point function is exactly this. Okay. Now that we understand, uh, um, now that we understand two-point functions, we are going to define normal ordered operators. How will we define normal ordered operators? By mix here. Same definition as last time. All we have to do is to replace the two-point function between x and x by the two-point function between b and c. Same definition. All the manipulations go through same way. Because all manipulations that are true of Gaussian integrals for commuting fields, or formal properties of Gaussian integrals for commuting fields, are also true of uh, Gaussian integrals of anti-commuting fields. All of our, in fact, it's easier. Uh, all of our derivations that we went through in the last class, was it last class or the last class? Well, the, either last or class for last, when we carefully derived this weak expansion, we had this exponential formula for weak expansions and so on. This f is a function, you remember all that, right? Okay, all of those remain true, anti commuting fields. Everything goes through unchanged. So once again, we have this normal ordered symbol that we would use to define product of operators. Okay. Now that we've got all this, all this clear, we're going to now study. We're going to now study the following stress tests. T of Z, which is normal order del B C minus lambda del of B C. Contractions do we get? 
First thing we get is everything contracts. B contracts with C, B contracts with C. How many ways do we have to bring it? One. C contracted with B would give Z, 1 over Z minus W. Differentiate with respect to W, what does that give you? 1 over Z minus W square, no minus sign. Okay. This guy is gone. Okay. Now we've got del PC. B contracted with C is 1 over Z minus W. Differentiate with respect to Z, what do we get? 1 over Z minus W with a minus square with a minus sign. Okay. So all contractions were minus 1 over Z minus W. Number four. Clear. Now we have other things we could do. Okay. We could contract del B with C and leave this guy as it is. If we leave this guy as it is, we get C of Z, B of W. What about the sign? When we take this guy through C and we take through B, two signs, so no sign. So del B with C. 1 over Z minus W, the whole thing square with a minus. Minus. C del B. C is what's left behind. And we contract del B with? C del B. Thank you. Okay, and we contract this del B with C to get this. Please check my signs. Okay. Now, the other choice is to contract this guy with this guy. So, what you get? You get del B of Z, C of W, contract, contract this guy with this guy, obviously no sign. Uh, and we get Z minus W over the square, because the derivative acts in the second thing. Okay, and now if we're going to do a thorough job, let's still and expand this about W. So the term independent of lambda, the Taylor expanded around W, gives us what? Gives us minus one by Z minus W the whole thing before. Mm. Minus one Now this guy is. Uh, First term is just C del B plus del B C, but there's a minus sign, so the two add up. Okay? The two add up to give, uh, and which can be written? Del B C. So plus 2 del B C over Z minus W, the whole thing squared W. And then there's the Taylor expansion. This will give us minus del C B plus del B C over Z minus W. Del C del Del B plus del del square del square B C. But now, what was the uh, del B? So this we write as equal to minus one by z minus w to the whole thing to Can I just write it? This can you see that this is the same thing as plus derivative on del B C. Remember the sign. Yeah. Okay. So it's plus derivative on del B. Excellent. So we say that this stress tensor at lambda equals zero. We see that this stress tensor at lambda equals zero is by itself <coughs> obeys the Okay? So that's sort of like the free boson of being to without the beam. Okay? Now we need uh, to keep track of the lambda. So first let's do the lambda square. 
So lambda square tells what? It's lambda square del z del w of bc bc. Okay. So let's just take and expand this. So it's lambda square del z del w of firstly if we got bc with you know, CB with BC, that's one by one over Z minus W. The other guy is also one over Z minus W. So that's one over Z minus W squared. Maximum singularity. <coughs> okay. Okay. Then we get this CB contract. So we get plus BZ C of W by Z minus W. Or we can get this BC contract. So plus C of Z B of W. Okay. Or we could have this CB contracting. No, sorry. This BC contracting. So C of Z B of W. Once again, by Z minus W. Yeah. So this is equal to lambda square del z del w of where are we? Uh, one by z minus w the whole thing square. Uh, now, if we just said z equals w, that's bc, that's cb, they cancel. So the only terms that we get are from differentiating. So we get plus del B C W uh, plus del C B of W. Okay. So that's plus. What is that? Sorry. This one. Sorry. I'll just write del B C plus del C B of Z minus W. Uh, this Z hitting this guy 
at this depth, this guy I think this bomb. Okay. Uh, so we can have this del z hitting this guy, so that's del b c. Uh, w hitting this guy is with a 1, z minus w hitting square. Or we could have, minus. sorry, minus? No, no. Uh, or we could have the w hitting, so what do we do here? z hitting this and here. So we can have w hitting c and z hitting b so that we give us minus uh, B just C sorry B L C this is a Z this is a W Z and W um, okay uh, over Z minus W the whole thing is okay. You got minus one you say? No, the derivative went through. Derivatives can go through. Derivative is not an anti -commute. Okay, or we could have both these guys and these guys, which give us plus del b z del c of w over z minus w over okay. okay, should I should I simplify? I'm sorry, I'm just wondering. I'm sorry, probably I'm probably mixed up. I mean, you could ask what is wrong with just using the data expansion function. It's much simpler. Thing. There's nothing wrong. It's just that I didn't like the answer. Uh, I want to say a BC. You mean, sorry, I'm probably. Let me do it. Yeah, I'm just. Can we do it as a second? If you volunteer. Okay, fine. Let's do that. Okay, do it as an assignment. <laughs> okay, do it as, as an assignment. I'll tell you what it's meant. Okay, um, you get the standard operator product expansion of the stress tensor with C is equal to minus 3, 2 lambda minus 1, the whole thing squared plus 1. Z 
Okay? Excellent. Uh, N of Z, B, Z minus W, B of Z, that looks right. Okay. So, uh, now let's compute the, the most singular term. That you get by differentiating with this. So that's minus lambda, but a plus because of the derivative b of z divided by z minus w the whole thing is squared. Okay. And uh, uh, oh, what about this term here? This is uh, 1 minus lambda plus 1 minus lambda del b wait but yeah so far so far so good but now we also have to expand Taylor expand this thing. That Taylor expand, uh, expansion cancels this lambda del b. Okay? So this is equal to lambda del b of w over z minus w squared plus del b of z. Yeah, that was not so bad. Is that, is that clear? What we see is that with this stress tensor, the field b has weight lambda. Okay, so B is a primary operator under the stress tensor with weight lambda. Let's quickly do the same to C. Okay, let's quickly do the same for C. So that's del B C of Z and lambda L B C of Z of C of Z. Okay, so here, now we get, you know, a minus sign, because B has to go through. So we get minus sign, then we get derivative of one, mi one minus, one over Z minus W, that has another minus sign. So we get C of Z divided by Z minus W squared. That was this subtraction. <coughs> Confirm? Okay. Minus lambda del z of uh, again we get a minus sign because this b has to go through this. This is c of z over z minus w with a minus sign, so plus. Right? Okay. Now we just differentiate, so this is c of Okay, so firstly this is C of W by Z minus W the whole thing squared plus L C of W by Z minus W. Um, and then we get uh, plus lambda del Z C over Z minus W. Now this is del, del C, but now we can just take it as W because already just one singular laterally and then you get plus lambda c minus lambda c over z minus w the whole thing square this is c of z so this becomes c of w minus lambda del c over z minus w now every insertion is a w Okay, so this and this cancel, and we find 1 minus <laughs> lambda C of W by Z minus W the whole thing squared plus del C over Z Once again, C is a primary operator of dimension 1 minus.
Now the case, lambda equals half is the standard fringe fermion situation. Well, yes, C becomes one because it's like two, two free fermions, each of which has C equals half. Okay? In that case, both B and C have dimension half. Okay, lambda is half. Uh, one minus lambda is also half. However, the case that we will be interested in to start with in studying the bosonic string, the case that will arise because the first action on the well sheet of the string will have lambda is equal to 2. Okay? Now, get some, somebody good at arithmetic tell me what the central charge is. So it was. C is minus 26. This will be the origin of the 26 dimensions. Okay? That we found uh, while doing our, you know, asking for Lorentz invariants uh, on, on, on the in our, in our canonical quantization of string theory to start. Okay. Now, very, very quickly, um, in this theory, very, very quickly, I will uh, work out some details of the uh, state operator map. Maybe we should do that next class. Um, Let's do this in the next class. Okay, I hope to finish this. Make a of this. Drop in on the new theory. Let's test the this next class. We'll miss. Okay, so in the next class, we're going to understand this BC. Okay, so sorry, this is today's class, I know it's a bit grungy. Okay. There's a lot of expansions and not so many ideas. Um, next class will be more interesting. Next class will be more interesting because we'll very quickly finish the grunt stuff with this BC conformity theory. And then we'll go on to actually using it to try and understand how it works. Now, now that we've brought up, we will do a serious path integral quantization of that word sheet action with the string. Uh, not fixing some strange gauges, so seriously, path integral quantizer, and we'll understand things. Okay.